We all search for that spark which fuels our desire to fully engage in our lives. We look for the courage to experience moments where we can come alive instead of watching life pass us by. You're listening to The Front Row Factor, leaving fear and insecurity behind by exploring stories of top performers that are living life in the front row. Get ready to stand up, step up, and live it up with your host, John Vroman. Hey there, this is John Broman, and welcome to the Front Row Factor podcast. I'm grateful that you've chosen to spend your time with us today because I'm talking with Renee Heigl, who's a holistic practitioner and life coach, founder of Love Yourself Naked. I met Renee years ago, and I've watched her journey with great admiration, and you'll see why in this interview. Now, I asked Renee on the show to describe what loving herself naked means to her, so we'll get into that in a minute, but on her site, here's what you would read. It it means to strip down, to skinny dip, to stand on your head, hang upside down from a pole or from powerful trees, to look at your body in the mirror and like what you see, to wake up to being in your body, to heal your sugar addiction, to replace cravings with confidence, to end emotional eating for good, to indulge in real clean food, to radically nourish yourself, to stick with it, to get stronger, to find your power, to meditate, to be conscious, to rekindle your passion with your partner, to speak on stage in front of thousands, to write your book, to show up in your body, your relationships, your job, your life, to have a sparkle in your eye and a deeply happy heart. Wow. (laughs) If that doesn't make you want to listen to this episode, I don't know what will. But I will tell you, we get into a lot of great stuff here. We talk about how to deal with conflicting messages in your life and all the information that we're exposed to, what happens in our mind when we step into our fears how Renee shapes her physical environment and why it's one of the keys to her success, and what the heck are your adrenal glands and why are they so important to curing your energy crisis. We get into all that and so much more. So enjoy my interview with Miss Renee Heigl. All right, everybody. I've got Renee Heigl on the line. What is up, Renee? Hi. It's so good to be here. I imagine that there's a bunch of people listening, and if you are, you need to go to YouTube and search for this episode because uh, uh, this is one that you're going to want to see and participate in because uh, Renee and I have worn our Sunday best today. Yeah. (laughs) So, Renee, you know, as I love to start off with my best of friends, tell me what's good in your life right now. I want you to totally brag openly. I know you're such a humble person, and this is probably tough for you. But tell me what's going on and what's lighting up your soul right now. Yeah, thanks. I love starting out of my comfort zone. So Manny, my son, six and a half, he's just the most incredible human being. I know you get this. Yeah. Tiger's about the same age. Yeah. And lights up my entire world and every moment in conversation, like even the little tough struggle ones. And uh, he's so funny. So yeah, I, I've definitely become a better version of me because of him. And I have so much fun playing. Like we do lots of fun, crazy things from hula hooping to running down to the park. And <laughs> our park has these um, like hills made of the astro turf. Yeah. And we bring big cardboard boxes and slide down like it's a slide. No. Uh... Yeah. So lots of fun there. Uh, what else? I'm writing my book. So that's a big deal. Oh, nice. I actually have been writing my book for five years. We'll be honest. (laughs) But I never really had a concrete deadline. And I took quite a few breaks from it. So this is the serious, like, I'm in it. And that's really been a great cathartic. And I'm in a very creative point in my life. Mm. I'm also in the middle of the business that I run is seven years old now, which is hard to believe. We just started the seventh year and the last year has been about reestablishing the roots of the business, that they're really solid, like the foundation is good so it can grow. And so I I almost feel like it's slowed down in some sense, but not in a bad way, but the solid foundation is really there and I feel it. Mm. And so I'm creating a lot of new things and I can share what those are later, but really exciting things. And uh, I'm also in love with a really cool man named Rob. And so that's been fun. And uh, I have a lot of really good female friendships in my life, like really great, powerful, 
kick-ass women around me. <laughs> nice. And that feels great. Yeah. Yeah. I've been needing that and wanting it. So I'm so grateful. <laughs> so there's my brags. <laughs> That's good stuff. Well, I'm, I'm happy for you on so many levels from family stuff, the business stuff, you personally, that's a really wonderful spot to be in. And you deserve it. You've worked so hard to be where you are. Does it feel like for you that you have just blinked and the past seven years have, have passed? Yeah, it does. In, in many ways. Mostly I feel that way. That how can it possibly be this seven years have gone by? Right? Yeah. And then in other ways, there's been a lot of blood, sweat and tears to keep this business going and everything it takes to run a business. And a lot of the beginning of that business running was me being more of a consultant, you know, a, a, as a coach. And so learning the tools of taking it from consulting into what, you know, an actual business is. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, totally. When you look back on the last seven years, or maybe even before that, and I'm just going to, I'm going to get right to the big question, which is, by the way, as I say that, I'm like, this is not atypical for me <laughs> to just go right into it. Tell me about a transformational moment for you in your life, let's say, you know, in the past seven years that has caused the birth of this version of Renee. Yeah. Great getting right in there. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> well... 2012 was a really pivotal year for me. That year was hard because I felt like I was facing the reality of having to really stare myself in the eyes and ask the question, like, who the f I can, can I swear on this? Um, you can, you can. You, frick, frick works good. Sorry. It was going to come out. So I caught myself. <laughs> who the heck are you? Yeah. And who do you want to be? And when I started to look around at a lot of the life that I had built around me, and this is, you know, from career to the way I was running my business, to relationships, to the way I was treating myself, taking care of myself, uh, personal relationships with my parents and my family, my primary relationship, the way I was parenting, I really had to reassess all of it. And I don't know if it was cosmic. <laughs> I don't know if it was just the time in my life, but I felt like I either had to wake up and really move forward and grow myself, grow my self-esteem, take action, or I was going to feel like I was living in a shell of myself. Mm. And it was very hard. Yeah, I don't want to call it a midlife crisis, but it was it was like that. There was those moments on the on the floor in the fetal position, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then at the same time, there was also these great moments of incredible freedom. And what ha kept happening is I just kept being faced with these choices that were really tough, really fearful choices. And what I saw in myself is I just kept stepping into them and I kept stepping into them. And I, you know, there's dozens of them, but all these moments where you never think that you could do that, and they're not even always the biggest moments, but they trigger all of your emotional and mental stuff so much. Yeah. And so when I saw that I was able to get through that and come out on the other side, it really gave me a sense of empowerment that I didn't know that I had in me. And I also noticed that the people that I had around me drastically changed because I was starting to demand a different level of respect for myself and therefore... Of course, that follows suit in all, <laughs> all of your life. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I want to dig in a little bit to what you said about stepping in. You were talking about fear, you know, and that there were these things that were based in, I think the word used was fearful. But tell us about what goes on in your mind in order to step into something that you're afraid of. For me, you know, I can speak for myself. There's a lot of limiting belief stuff that comes up. And one of them for me was a huge story of needing to be liked. Yeah. And without sounding cliche, like really using my voice and standing up for what I needed and knowing that that wasn't selfish. And uh, my business is called Love Yourself Naked. Yeah. But what really came to was me living more deeply into that, like really, truly loving myself. And so I had to listen to some of those fears and say, I don't give a shit what people think of me, yeah. like truly. And, you know, you can say that 
And there's part of you who can mean it in one minute. But when it really comes down to it, can you own that? And can you keep walking forward in that that space? And some of the other fear for me, too, really came down to uh, a sense of worth. So financially, I became a single mother. And now I'm running a business. I didn't have a whole lot of income coming in. And I really felt like I jumped off a cliff. Sure. <laughs> that analogy we use, jump off the cliff and you'll be caught. And I think that that really gave me a lot of strength because I knew that I would be, I'd figure it out. I just knew that. And there's never been a doubt in my mind that I wouldn't figure it out. But there certainly have been very scary moments. And it's just always kept working out. It kept working out. And so I had to learn to trust myself, universe, God, in a whole different way. (laughs) Totally. And yeah, so those are some big ones. I can relate to the uh, the money piece because in 2008, when I stepped away from a corporate position into the speaking, coaching, and running the Front Row Foundation full time, I spent all my savings year one. I went massively into debt year two, and they were calling to foreclose on my home. And it was, uh, you know, I had a newborn at the time. And I remember this odd balance of both being scared and being fired up to go win the day. And it was like one moment I'm terrified and the next moment I'm just immersed in trying to get it going and get it working. That's tough. And I relate to that. Yeah, I remember having and I still have these in my office right now. Like I had little notes all over my walls, like constant reminders of like, leave your crap at the door, give 100 percent, you know, like all those things that we use to just keep me going and um What also comes out in those moments, though, is a really big sense of the gumption that you have to persevere. There's a negative side to that, especially as a holistic practitioner. I learned quite a bit about burning the candle at both ends because I I definitely triggered my workaholism (laughs) and burned out my adrenal glands and I was you know, falling asleep way too early at the wrong times a day. And I was like, oh, this is, you know, this isn't good. So it really catapulted me to a much more way of living that entrepreneurial spirit and doing it in a way, though, that felt, I, I will just put it this way. I had more ease in my day to day. The word balance sometimes bothers me. So I don't, I don't avoiding using that because <laughs> it's a constant assessment, you know, based on what's going on in our life. But sure. I had to start learning how to do this, how to how to be a leader in the healthy world and actually live it in my life, which, you know, of course, I always had in a lot of different ways. But when you start getting in that fearful mode at times, you know, your defenses come up and you don't always take care of yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I made a note. I want to come back to the adrenal part because I feel like I may have adrenal fatigue <laughs> <laughs> and I might need some coaching for you on that. I'd imagine that a lot of the people listening to are go-getters and they're go-givers to quote Bob Berg on that one. But th- these are people who are burning the candle because they want to live life in the front row. And that is like, <laughs> they're all in it. But we should talk about that. So maybe we'll come back to that when we get into some of what you do to support and serve others. I want to talk for a moment about shaping your environment, because in this conversation, we talked about hanging these notes up around you, yeah. you know, leave your stuff at the door, give a hundred percent. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see behind me, there's like post-it notes all over the place. Yeah. I'm actually going to even turn the camera. You can see big dry erase boards and all sorts of stuff that are around me because I like to advertise to myself. And I think that's a part of the front row factor is uh, what's in your front row. So I love to hear you say that. Can you expand on that a little bit as to how have you taken care of your physical environment and how did that help you to create and to feel empowered throughout your day? This is enormous question, by the way, for me. (laughs) Absolutely enormous. So I went from, I lived for nine to 10 years in in a quite a pretty large home with a lot of things, a lot of stuff you know, a closet that is basically the size of my bedroom right now, you know? And so stuff was somewhat important to me, I guess, but, you know, I I think I probably took some of it for granted. And so when I moved, 
in uh, 2012, I moved to this tiny little 1,200 square foot bungalow, and I took very little things with me. But I had I was forced to let go of a lot and release attachment to things very specifically. So then what happened is I moved in and I realized that I was living in this cute little house, but there was just stuff everywhere. And it started to feel so cramped. And I knew that I needed to do the purge again. Now, as luck would have it, I found out about nine months after living in this little bungalow that there was black mold in the house, Whoa. which is very unfortunate. And uh, yeah, and it was airborne. And I I was having some symptoms of things that I couldn't explain. And that's kind of how I came about learning about this. So within four days of discovering the black mold and having it tested, I I was out of there. So I found this like tiny little crappy apartment that was uh, what I thought was in a nice area, but turned out not to be. And the black mold was in the basement of this little bungalow. And because it was airborne, pretty much everything I had in the basement had to be thrown away. No way. Yeah, like lots of things, you know, like, you know, the Christmas, not all of it, but a lot of stuff. Uh, my luggage, you know, just anything that it, it could have touched. And here I am now moving again in nine months later. And I remember the driveway of this bungalow and pretty much everything I owned was in this pile to be picked up by this huge trash thing. And then the next day, Purple Heart is the place near me where you donate to. And then they showed up and there goes like a huge amount of donation. And I'm sitting there thinking, whoa. Yeah. (laughs) It was very liberating, actually, but also a little sad, but it was important. I just knew it was important. So then when I moved to this small little apartment, it was so tiny, probably 800 square feet we're at now. So now I had this little storage unit that we get when we're in college with a bunch of crap in it. And that was for a year. And I, I thought to myself, well, I haven't looked at it in a year. Wow. So do I really even need any of the stuff in here? Probably not. And so, you know, it, life kept giving me opportunities to purge and start <laughs> almost completely over. And it was probably about nine months ago that I actually felt like I have finally, I feel like in a place where most stuff is cleared. I have to give props to Marie Kondo. There's a book, right? I refer to all my clients. And I started her journey, I don't know how long ago, I want to say eight months ago or something. And so then that was another tier of of going through and you know, there's still some things, but I've done it all, like her whole book. I did the pictures, I did the, and energetically, I feel like a new person. I can't even describe the difference. I, I can't even describe. <laughs> and the book for those listening is The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, right? That's the one, mm-hmm. which I looked at on Amazon yesterday, has 8,300 Probably five star reviews, but uh, yeah. just unbelievable. You know, our buddy Hal Elrod, who wrote The Miracle Morning, is just, I mean, he's his book is world famous and it's got 1300 reviews and her book has 8000. What? It's crazy. <laughs> totally nuts. And rightfully it should because it's definitely impacted a lot of lives. It's amazing. And we could tell people, right? Like the essence of that book is sort of does it spark joy? That's one of the big questions. And I can totally endorse what you're saying as well, Renee, because looking around my office right now, I have gotten rid of so many things because I just walked in and said, if that doesn't help me to further the mission or that doesn't spark massive joy, it's out of here. And I have literally let go of so much stuff. And I walk down and I feel light and free when I I walk down, meaning this is in my basement, but it's uh, environment is important. Very important. There was a a big shift in my but this was deep rooted probably from childhood where I knew that having stuff around me, and I don't mean necessarily piles of things all the time, although I did have the pile on my desk a lot, you know, (laughs) but I mean, trinkets and just things. And I started to realize that clean space was very inviting to my creativity. And, you know, there's no perfection here. I still notice my little piles that creep up. You know, Rob would tell you that I get the laundry clean and (laughs) it sits in the basket for days, you know, (laughs) but it's so different. It's so different. Yeah. 
That's cool. They they must have taught you that at IAN because Tatiana does the exact same thing. <laughs> you guys are educated in the same camp. Yeah. Let's talk about your brand, uh, Love Yourself Naked. That's correct. I'm saying it right. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. I remember when I'd first seen it, I was like, oh, that is so brilliant. Un- you know, it's just great. What does it mean to love yourself naked? First, it means powerful changes must be afoot. You know, it's a strong statement. And I often like to say when people hear that, there's one or two answers usually. People are either really intrigued by what does that mean or people get tremendously triggered by it. Mm. You know, they get something inside them is wants to shut down. Often those are the people who probably need to look at it the most. Mm. <laughs> and what to me it means, I mean, the reason that I even came up with that name, I used to have a different, you know, I became a health practitioner and I had a different name for my business that I was starting at the time. And uh, it wasn't really working. And I wasn't necessarily looking for a name. This came very organically. But I had three clients at the same time. One of them looked kind of like a Selma Hayek-ish, you know, like petite body, newly married, didn't, uh, was afraid to skinny dip with her hu- new husband. And, uh, you know, they just had a pool and they, she's like, yeah, I, I'm afraid to be naked in front of him. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I know where our calls are going in our, our sessions because I wanted her to really embrace her body. And then I had another client who was in her seventies and she had been an anorexic and bulimic for most of her entire life. So imagine being 70 and just the disdain for herself and her body. I had a male client who hated himself ultimately. And then I had a woman client who was about 75 pounds overweight, would not look in the mirror, very unhealthy eating habits and unhappy in her relationship. And I started looking at these four people and I thought, okay, well, they all have way different stories, but they all have this one thing in common that they're not loving and accepting of themselves. Their self-esteem is down here. And they're reaching outside for something to fill themselves up, various things depending on the person. And so to me, loving yourself is about the feeding of yourself. You know, it's the physical, it's the emotional connection, it's the mental part, the, you know, to grow your self-esteem, you have to take action. And a lot of times we don't take the action, we aren't our word. And then what that does is it triggers a lot of shame and guilt. We beat ourselves up, right? And then we get stuck in this cycle. And so kind of a long answer, but a lot of people say to me, well, goodness, I don't love myself in my clothes, <laughs> let alone naked. And the promise is that it's not like you flip a switch and you love yourself. The promise is that you get to go on a journey to love and accept yourself. And that comes in a lot of various ways. Tell me, Renee, about some of your, maybe think of one, I know you've worked with many, many people, think of one of your favorite or top of mind success stories with a client. What's happened with that person and how did it light you up? The example I'll give you is actually something I realized recently, and this is, I should probably talk about more, but like you were saying at the beginning, I don't always brag about myself, but (laughs) it's not one client. I counted it up. It's either eight or nine. I'd have to double check. Clients that have come to me who were needing to learn how to feed themselves, needing to learn how to love themselves, and desperately on some level without probably sharing it all the time, really wanted to find the quote unquote love of their life. And all eight of those people are with somebody who they consider to be the love of their life. No way. That's great. And so it's been kind of an exciting thing because I'm like, wow, you know, when you teach people how to show up for themselves in a different way and to feel what I consider to be whole, yes. then you attract an, a person, you know, on that same page as you. And so it's like a consequence of loving yourself. Yeah, I didn't seek that out with them, right? It would just kind of happened and I realized it and I thought, wow, I should actually be promoting this because it's a really cool thing. And it makes me really happy because those people are all in my life in a lot of ways, some more than others, but we all keep in touch. And so I get to mm. see, you know, they are having babies now or they're engaged and they're sending me photos and I'm just seeing their faces lit up and them really passionate in their lives. And it's almost like having a lot of kids. <laughs> it's a really cool feeling. Wow. That's awesome. That's really fun, Renee. That's, I can see how that is your smile, you yeah. know, if everybody's listening, like you have this, you're just lit up by that. That's really fantastic. 
who do you want to fight for the most? You know, how do you define the type of person that you want to fight for? I think you've been getting to that. I think you've been talking about maybe who these type of people are, but how do you answer that in the easiest way? What comes to mind is deep suffering and I'm going to say it, addiction. You know, I think that most people are addicted to their minds. You know, we we categorize that sometimes with like drugs or alcohol or something, but I feel like that's a huge issue in our world, especially with social media and a lot of other things. So people who are really deep in suffering and reaching and not sure how to find themselves, those are the people I like to help. That's so interesting. As you just said that, I thought I certainly if somebody talks about addiction, I always go to drugs and alcohol. But the minute that you started talking about how else we could view that, I thought I'm totally addicted almost daily to something. And it's I'm addicted to the excuse. I'm addicted to my story. I'm addicted to whatever. You know, there are moments when I feel I'm addicted to sugars or even like I'm addicted to like just playing and not working. <laughs> like it's like there are weeks that go by where work is tougher than others. Yeah. Very interesting. What does ultimate wellness look like if somebody were to achieve ultimate wellness, what would that be? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is longevity, because isn't that why we're here? Like we want to live long, I think, right? (laughs) I do. And for each person, that's going to look a little different. You know, there's not a cookie cutter. I mean, there's a lot of great plans out there, but usually you have to find your path to what that longevity is. And so ultimate wellness is being able to live in a very specific way where you feel like you have these core habits, things that you can rely upon that maybe sometimes it takes the thinking out of it. You know, like I work out every day at this time or I drink my green smoothie every day at this time. But it also doesn't feel like it's a have to. It feels nourishing. And just like you're saying, I mean, you put it in in an interesting way, like almost addicted to play and stuff. But I find that all people are creative individuals, all of us. And actually, the book, Big Magic by uh, Elizabeth Gilbert. Elizabeth Gilbert, yeah. Yeah, good book. She kind of, she talks about that a ton. But uh, yeah, you know, this, this creativity that's within us, it's really very specific path to be creative. You have to have a balance. And sometimes that's days of play. And, you know, sometimes I guess it's different if you're an entrepreneur, you're working nine to five. And sometimes that's having a few days where you do indulge in the brownies. And so you're finding what fuels you without going to this crazy extreme. And if you do, can you come back? Right. So I find that, you know, if I and to fast forward to when I'm like 115, that'd be cool. You know, <laughs> I, I'd want to have great energy yeah. and I'd want to feel super creative and I'd want to feel really present in my relationships. And so whatever tools that we need to get to get to those points would be powerful. Speaking of great energy, what do you think are, you know, two or three of your habits that have allowed you to get more energy? Let's actually use this as a great transition to go to the adrenal topic a little bit. Yeah. Let's dig into that for a second. So I know listeners are like energy. Yes, you got me. I'm listening. Right. So talk about that a little bit. So before I do, I'll just share where the adrenals are. I find that if you know where they're at in your body, it's helpful. So for those who don't know, the adrenal glands are about the shape of a walnut. You have two of them and they sit in your low back right on top of your kidneys, essentially. Mm -hmm. And they're very, very powerful little guys. I don't know if they're guys or girls, but you get the idea. And They allow us to manage our stress state. They allow us to manage our cravings in a big way. And so if we crave lots of sugar, lots of salt sometimes, it's because our adrenals may be off. And then what also it does is allows our metabolism and the adrenal glands are super important, super, super important. And they give us ultimately tools to control our hormones which allows our energy level. And I'm simplifying this a lot for the sake of not boring people. But yeah, sure. You know, when we really want an optimal energy level, we have to look at, are we supporting our adrenal glands? And when I say supporting, what I mean is that 90 ish percent of people have adrenal fatigue at some point in their life, Mm. you know, like most people do. And it's very common. And it's not something that doctors talk about. You know, they're just not taught about it for the most part. Some are, but it's very rare. And so 
it's a huge conversation amongst the, you know, heavy hitter entrepreneurs who've had experienced it. And they're like, why in the heck am I like all of a sudden lacking energy? Where did my creativity go? Where did that drive that I had to like grow this thing? And a lot of it has nothing to do with the fact that you lost it or you don't have willpower. It's because you burnt out your adrenal glands <laughs> and you need to go support them. And I can give some tips if you want on how to do that. But the other thing too about energy is you know, a lot of people talk about gut health and it's kind of a fascinating conversation about the microbiome. And this is the, you know, the inner lining of your, your small intestine and your stomach and, you know, a lot of the other organs that we have in there. And that gets broken down over the course of time from a lot of various environmental toxins and foods and prescription drugs and etc. So when we don't have that in a stronger state or at strongest state, then what we'll find is a lot of the toxins that come into our body, they won't know what else to do. They can't get processed out through the liver. So what they do is they get reabsorbed into our bloodstream. And so then we carry more toxicity and it sucks the energy out of us and we get more tired and we crave more junk food. And then, you know, it's almost like a, you know, a a pattern then of going downhill unless we support ourselves. So those two things, adrenals, heal your gut, move your body would be the third one because that helps to process. And that becomes a little different, you know, because sometimes people who have adrenal fatigue, if they're like a really heavy active exercise person, they might need to back off a little bit, you know, because the adrenals don't like you to push yourself too much if they're burnout. (laughs) Yeah. And I say this as a practitioner, but also I totally lived through massive adrenal fatigue for like two and a half years. What are some symptoms of adrenal fatigue? What would show up for somebody? I think you said cravings. Sugar cravings for sure. Sugar cravings for sure. Yeah. Being extra thirsty. Another one would be irregular sleep patterns. So you know how if we're really in tune with our body, we can start to feel that we get tired, maybe around nine or 10 o'clock. And a big symptom of adrenal fatigue is when you get to that 10 o'clock mark or 11, and then you start getting a second wind and then you can't fall asleep till two or three in the morning. That's like, okay, the adrenal glands are working overtime. And this has a lot to do with cortisol in your brain and how the body releases that. And then another one to pay attention to you know, you may have a tender low back where the adrenals actually are. So look at that. And cranky, lack of focus, kind of losing your steam. Like, why can't, why can't I get anything done? (laughs) You know, and sometimes that's other things too. So I'm being a little general there, but. If they're fatigued, is that the word, right? If your adrenals are fatigued, Mm -hmm. then how long does it take them to get charged back up? And I don't even know what that means, but. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's a good way to put it. Charge those babies up. Yeah. If the batteries are depleted, how long until they're charged? People don't like this answer because it's long. It's like six months to a year sometimes. No way. Yeah. Here's me. Okay. I'm like, that's such bull crap. Like I can do that in two months. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm I'm invincible, right? That's the story we tell ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And I'm I'm healthy. So I got that. And um no, it's it's a longer process, but it's really when your adrenals burn out, it's a symptom also emotionally that you haven't been listening to your body. And there's other wake ups that can come from it where we start to realize the only way I can get this stuff done is if I kill myself to do it. And so what I learned from it ultimately was I had to really be very, very choosy with who I spent my time with, how I spent my time. And looking at my to-do list and being really, really specific. And so great lessons came from it because I was forced, really forced to slow the heck down. I had to get my sleep and I had to get good foods in and I I had to uh, manage my stress state. Mm-hmm. You know, Because if you can't handle stress, you know, your adrenals are just going to get worse. Yeah. So meditation became imperative which is always a good thing. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. hundred percent. If somebody was listening to this and they're like, I want to know more about this. uh, Where do I go learn more about the adrenals, how they might be showing up as fatigued, how I can get them charged up again? I'm sure there's a blog or two I have on my website at reneeheigel.com. They can also 
reach out to me on my contact form. They could give it a good old Google, which I don't always recommend with stuff, but you know, you can find, you find a video on YouTube or something about adrenal fatigue. It might just give you enough tools. And a, a couple quick tips too is your body needs B vitamins, you know, and so sometimes supplements to support us, like a good adrenal supplement. So make sure you have a good practitioner or somebody who can recommend what you need. Get yourself checked out. Yeah, I know one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking to her. Very cool. Tell us about, you got something coming up. Maybe it's already launched, winning the sugar game. Yeah. Yeah, tell me about that. Interesting part to the adrenal conversation. One of the things that can zap the adrenals is so much sugar. Okay, so when we keep putting in excess sugar in our body, whether we know we're doing it or not, because it's hidden in a lot of things, our adrenals can't handle it and our body can't handle it. So approximately five or six years ago, I started this program called Winning the Sugar Game. And the reason I started it back then, it was very different than it is now, but it was this uh, consequence of me being so incredibly addicted to sugar. Before I went to nutrition school and I became, you know, healthy, so to speak, I was eating lots of things in an incredibly unhealthy way. So if we had Oreo cookies, I'd eat like four. The next day I'm like, oh, wait, like I don't want these in the house. So if I just eat the whole bag, then they won't be here anymore. Right. And so then then they'd be gone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you and I met in like the Cutco days and Back then, you know, I was uh, in my young 20s and I was running this Cutco office and I didn't take care of myself at all. You know, I, I really knew nothing about it. And so I ate a lot of Snickers bars and a lot of Cliff bars and Slim Fast shakes and Wonder Bread with peanut butter and, you know, all all those things. And I noticed these unhealthy eating habits. And so when I finally got to the point where I was able to cut the sugar out, I was really proud of myself and this was a really big deal and I maintained it for quite some time. But then slowly I started noticing that I was eating two or three teaspoons of raw honey a day. I was putting the extra maple syrup on my oatmeal. I was buying the organic cookies that were filled with sugar. And so the sugar thing came back, but it was just the healthy sugars. And then lo and behold, you know, a year or two later, I have a baby and that affects adrenal glands. So I'm now depleted in a lot of nutrients and I'm craving sugar, sugar, sugar. And so it was a new way for me to realize, okay, this is emotional. This is uh, not just about the physical body. It's emotional too. And so I had to look at both. And I took all my life coaching background and I took all my nutrition background and I created this program and I just tested it on some clients and they had great results. I had great results. And so now fast forward years later, I'm making it into a seven day detox, which my goal in doing that is because I want everyone to have access to it because it's such a huge issue. Thousands of people I've had conversations with now in my world and health most every single person has an issue with sugar. Absolutely. It's like the devil or something. It's not like this horrible thing, but what it does is it literally makes us age more. It, it takes longevity. It throws it out the window, lowers our immune system, and it makes us cranky and irritable and lots of other things. And so sometimes when we can remove it, we can find this certain level of peace and creativity and health. For sure. Of course, the weight loss and all the other things we want to come with it. And so I'm super passionate about it and I have a very big connection to it personally. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's where our heart gets tied to serving uh, many times is we struggled with it and we just want to pay it forward. If we found if we found the keys to the kingdom, we want to pass them along. Yeah. The whole sugar thing is fascinating. I read somewhere at some point that sugar was more addictive than like cocaine or heroin or so, I, it was something like is a massive addiction. It's true. And then I look at Tiger, who, you know, we talked about earlier, six years old and how he gets crazy about sugar at times. And I think, well, of course, I mean, if that's the reality, if it's as addictive as that, then I've exposed him to that. Of course, he's crazy about it. Yeah. Manny is too. And, you know, in the culture we live in where there's advertisements on things in schools and it, so that is a fact, you know, that's actually from a scientific study back in 1998 in France and they tested it on laboratory rats and gave them the option of essentially heroin or sugar and they chose sugar. <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. That's that's crazy. There's been a ton of other research since then. Yeah. Share it all, but you can Google that. And ironically, I mean, there's a very specific process that I help people with to stop eating it for a little while so they could retrain their taste buds and balance their cravings. But the way that I really help them is honestly taking the addiction cycle that you would use to help somebody through alcoholism or other various addictions and teaching somebody how to use that addiction cycle with sugar. And that's what works. It's a challenging thing to wrap your head around. A lot of people are like, don't call me an addict, but it's so weird because sugar is so acceptable and we bake brownies with grandma when we were little. So it's a good thing. you know. And what I have found personally is that deprivation doesn't work with it, you know, so you have to go cold turkey to, to break the habit initially, but eventually, and everyone's different. I myself have found a level of uh, a beautiful peace with it. And I never thought I could have this. And that's why I think it's so powerful is I always felt like I'd be so addicted to it and I wouldn't be able to keep something like cookies in my house without eating them. All Manny's Halloween candy is still in my house. It's been sitting there since months late and I don't even think about it. I don't care about it. it it doesn't affect me. I can eat grandma's cake the other night at her house and have a little bite and appreciate it and walk away. And so for those people who really feel like it's controlling them, there's hope. There's hope. <laughs> That's, there's some powerful words right there. There is hope. I love it. <laughs> Earlier in the interview, Renee, we talked about living to, you said 115, right? And we want to live for a long time. You love life. We've actually been fortunate enough to share some really cool experiences in life together. We've We've actually traveled a bit together. Our families have kind of united in different ways. We've spent some time in Ohio with some mutual friends, a concert or two. So I know you're passionate about life, and I really appreciate that. As you know, in the Front Row Foundation, we help people, as you're a supporter, we help people who are fighting for their lives. So one of the topics that comes up often is our mortality. And, uh, you know, I remember seeing a video online. I don't remember what it was titled, but it was about jelly beans. And it was like, this: if these jelly beans represent how many days or weeks or whatever you have in your life, this is your life on average. Yeah. These type of representations are very powerful for me. How do you process mortality? How do you feel about addressing that in your life? I love this question. There came a point in my life where I had to, and it, this was kind of triggered by a, a person in my life who was a mentor at the time, but I basically had to face my own death. It was a coaching practice over time. And honestly, the death of my son, which seems so crazy to even say that out loud, but <laughs> what I noticed within me that there was a big fear of me being able to live my life because I on some deep subconscious level that I didn't probably even see, I was so afraid to die. You know, I was so afraid of my son dying. And so I, I had to go through this process of watching myself kind of die in visualizations. In fact, there's a, a beautiful book, Paulo Coelho. I, I don't remember if it was The Alchemist or his other book, but in one of those books, he actually kind of shares a practice that he did. And I remember reading that shortly after and it really impacting me. It's after that, it, I felt so incredibly free, you know, like the way, best way I can describe it is, you know, I end up getting a tattoo on my wrist that says now and uh, in that like there's this moment, this moment and nothing else matters. Like I, I, if I die tomorrow, I'll feel really OK, like knock on wood, of course. right? right. <laughs> but, you know, that as long as I give whatever I can today and show up fully, and then I feel really, really good about that. And it's there's a sense of peace. So does that answer the question? I don't know. I think I lost it. Okay. I think it does completely. For me, and I've shared this before on this show, that I, there have been times when I've been boarding an airplane and uh, sitting on the runway and just I have this vision like, what if this was it? And I quickly send that text message to Tatiana. I think to myself that imagining that this could be it brings me right back to the power of this present moment. I think that uh, none of us need to live thinking about our end. We need to address that enough to where it brings us back to this present moment and the importance of life. Sometimes we just think this is never going to end and we start to take it for granted. And like, there's always going to be tomorrow, yeah. but that's not always true. And so 
we need to get to the present moment right away. I can't believe it's already 50 minutes that have passed. Oh, wow. It's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> I could talk to you for hours, and I know people listening could just keep listening for hours. A comment I get regularly is that, like, how can I improve the show? They're like, make it longer. <laughs> make it longer. That's good. But I want to be respectful to my guests, and I know they've got busy lives. I want to ask you a couple of questions that I'd love to get your gut reaction to. This would be one word or one sentence is the goal. So gut reaction. Okay. What is a book or documentary that should be mandatory for everybody to experience? Cowspiracy documentary or a uh, anything Michael Pollan. Yeah, I think those should be mandatory. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a personal mantra or a favorite quote? How good can you stand it? Yeah, that's a great one. I love that. In the end, what do you want to be most remembered for? Listening and presence. And what live event would you most want to see front row? Ooh, Elon Musk. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see him talk about all his adventures. He comes up a lot on this show. I think he comes up. I think he comes up on a lot of people's shows. <laughs> <laughs> if there's one guy who would bet, you know, struggles with staying humble, it's got to be him with all the praise coming his way. Yeah. What's something that our front row community can do in the next 24 hours, Renee, to live life in the front row? Meditate. Start a meditation practice, even if you don't know how to do it. Five minutes, sit and breathe sit with your body. Where would you send a beginner who says, where do I even start? Where do I go to learn about meditation enough to even do that? First, I would tell them that they don't need to learn about it, that their body already knows how to do it. So download the app called Insight Timer, set a timer and practice sitting with yourself. Notice thoughts that come in and let them go and breathe. They're going to come back like your thinking is normal. And so just sit with yourself. And if you commit to the practice of sitting, then the rest will start to follow. Amazing how difficult that can be. I know. Yeah. Easier said than done. <laughs> Mindfulness or meditation for me this past year has been one of the critical pieces that's helped me to be a better father, to be a better businessman, to, I think, help with my adrenal fatigue. Yeah. Uh, I think managing my stress throughout the day, I'm much more conscious and aware of when my jaw gets clenched or my hands are tight or I'm not breathing. I'm just like holding my breath. Yeah. In fact, scientifically, the meditation will help more than most drugs and vitamins for all things. So, Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's so fascinating. Somebody said recently that they're like, this whole mindfulness thing is just about to just blow up. Mm -hmm. so it's like, I think it's blowing up now, but I think it's... Didn't it already do that years ago? Yeah, like, I know. Like I... centuries ago, but some of us just caught, caught on now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we're just late to the party. I'm late to the party. <laughs> That's funny. It's like, you know, the phrases like that are ones like it reminds me of like Saturday Night Live, where people say Saturday Night Live isn't as good as it used to be or whatever. And I'm like, I think people have been saying that for like 20, 30 years. Yeah. Very interesting. That was similar, but in reverse order. So final thoughts for the audience here, Renee, any parting words of wisdom or an invitation, a challenge to the group, anything to say? Consume more books and turn off your TV, um, you know, whether it's Audible, no affiliation. I just love them. I listen to so many books now and read more, create, like find ways that spark your creativity and don't take, even if you don't know what it is yet, just find ways to play, to sit and be with yourself. I, that can be challenging sometimes, like just sit and be with yourself. But I think that's the reason we need to do it. And kind of get away from the noise a little bit so you can find yourself, your connection. Real quick, best book you've read this past year? Oh, goodness. In the past 12 months or one book that you enjoyed? Uh, best book, best book. Well, I have two things that come to mind. Advanced Energy Anatomy by Carolyn Mace, really great book. And then on Audible, there's a thing called The Courses. And there's one, um, I'm trying to think of the name, biology and human behavior. That's really, really good. I mean, even if you don't like that idea, but there's something called, I think it's called the courses on Audible. And you can basically go to school with master level professors at any point in time for like 12 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> that is just awesome. Mm -hmm. Renee, where do people go get more of you? I know you mentioned it earlier. 
I have a free program on winning the sugar game. And then I also have a seven day detox and you can just go to winning the sugar game.com. And then if you want more info about me, go to Renee Heigl.com and you'll find me, you know, all over social media tweets stuff. I have somebody as we were talking today, I was like, Oh, I know somebody who I'm going to send to you that I know needs to hire you for coaching. So if you've, <laughs> if you've got openings and your very busy schedule, this uh, would be an awesome client. Thank you. Renee, this has been really wonderful. Again, if you're not watching this, you should see Renee's <laughs> smile. She's lighting up the room. It's just been such a joy to talk with you. Thank you. Such a pleasure to have a front row seat to your journey, to watch you grow and change and evolve. I'm really excited for you and your life and your future. I'm excited for Manny and for Rob, and I'm excited for the world that gets to be exposed to your brilliance. I love that you're a student and then you're a teacher. And you just stay in that mode of learning and sharing. For that, I just am truly grateful. And as I say to all my guests on the show, Renee, and I mean this because we only bring on people that we love, respect, appreciate, and want to share their message. So this applies. And that is, thanks for creating a world that my boys will grow up in. You are part of Team Human. And uh, I know that whenever you do something great today, that you're directly affecting my kids. And for that, my heart thanks you. Uh -huh. Thank you. It's been so incredible. I love talking with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, let's do it again sometime. Yes, we shall. All right, and I hope to see you. We need another Dave concert in our future. I know. <laughs> we'll, we'll plan something this summer. All right, cool. <laughs> Ciao for now. Okay. Hey, hey, it's John again. Thanks for listening to today's show. Check out Renee Heigl at ReneeHeigl.com or WinningTheSugarGame.com. If you enjoyed today's show, ask yourself who would benefit from listening to this also and share it with a friend. Share the love. I want to thank you also for being a sponsor of this show. As you know, we don't have formal sponsors, so we front all of the cash and all of the resources and energy to make it possible, so we have a favor to ask of you. If you're digging the show, please go to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. To make it easy, we put together a URL that'll take you directly there. Go to frontrowfactor.com slash review. In fact, if you're listening to this on your phone, just click on my face on the cover art. It'll pop open a screen with the show notes and a link to leave a review. You can do it right from your phone. In fact, screenshot it immediately when you do and email me john at frontrowglobal.com so I can thank you personally. That's J-O-N, no H, at frontrowglobal.com. Also, if you're listening to the show and you are a speaker, a trainer, a presenter, somebody who values connecting with others, you work in small groups, large groups, you're an employee or an entrepreneur, if you do this professionally or want to do speaking professionally, we highly recommend checking out speakertrainerexperience.com. It's a two-day live event that's hosted by myself and my co-host, John Berghoff, who is a phenomenal facilitator, world-class, and we provide an intense, exclusive and experiential training for presenters, speakers, and trainers. Check it out, speakertrainerexperience.com. There's a quick video there that will give you a peek behind the scenes at what takes place at that event. This year's event, this spring, is sold out, but if you can go there and check it out, you can get on a list and be notified when we run this again. Also, going back to Renee's episode here, there's an encore, so don't forget, two days from now, we release a 10-minute Q&A, questions from you in our community directly to our guests. Now, if you want to ask questions and you haven't yet, Go to frontrowfriends.com, join our Facebook group, and post your questions there. And we'll ask them to future guests. Thanks for listening. Really enjoy your support. I hope you're enjoying these shows. We want to keep bringing you tremendous value through inspirational people, people that are living their lives in the front row. And we encourage you to do the same. So until next time, get out there, take action with courage, and live your life in the front row. That's all for this episode of The Front Row Factor. To discover more simple and effective ways to lead a fearless front row life, visit frontrowfactor.com and subscribe to John's 4 Minutes in the Front Row, where he shares quick stories from real life experiences. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope our show inspires you to live big, give big, and experience life to the fullest. See you next week on The Front Row Factor.